Um, welcome, good evening. I'm Joseph Capizzi. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Human Ecology. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, as many of you know, uh, the Institute for Human Ecology was founded in 2016, shortly after the visit of Pope Francis to the university, and uh, the Institute was really inspired by his visit. We at the uh, IHE seek to bring the best uh, of Catholic social teaching and the Catholic intellectual tradition into conversation with um, our culture, our society, in order to sort of esteem its uh, flourishing um, and to help bring about good young men and women. I'm really pleased, uh, again, that we're joined by George Weigel. George has been uh, one of our um, closest friends at the Institute. He's been with us um, from the very, very beginning, uh, and I've known him since I arrived in, actually since before I arrived in D.C. I met George at Notre Dame when I was a graduate student. Uh, but his work, as I think we all know, um, is, uh, expresses a kind of deep love of the church and, of course, an unparalleled knowledge of the, its history, um, some of the major players of the 20th century and, and in, now into the 21st century. So it's always an honor to have George join us. As, uh, I don't want to spend too much time introducing him. Uh, we, we know what George does, but he is the Distinguished Senior Fellow uh, at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and he's the author of many, many books, including his newest one that we're going to discuss um, tonight. It's called To Sanctify the World, The Vital Legacy of uh, Vatican II. That book, um, that conversation brings us together tonight. Format is the same as always. Uh, we'll have a conversation. We'll, I'll ask George some questions. He'll do his best to answer me directly, or I'll pin him down. Um, I'll, I'll seek him out and pin him down. Uh, and then we'll open up uh, the floor to you guys to ask questions as well. We have a little reception, and we also have the opportunity to um, have your books signed by George or to purchase some books if you um, don't already own them. So be with us after this as well. But before we begin, um, speaking of being honored, I am deeply honored um, to be joined tonight by the president of the university, our new president, who took office as president on uh, July 1st, I believe, of 2022. So he's only been with us for a very, very short time, but we're already feeling his impact. Um, you can read into that anything you would like. Uh, <laughs> he was the provost and senior vice president for academic affairs at Illinois Institute of Technology from 2018 to 2022 and he previously served as Professor and McCloskey Dean of Engineering at the University of Notre Dame from 2008 to 2018. He has a doctorate in chemical engineering, and like George, he has hundreds of articles to his name. We're deeply grateful he's joined us tonight, so now I'm gonna turn this over to Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So I'm, I'm really delighted to be here tonight. Uh, when, I, when I heard that uh, George Weigel was gonna be uh, sharing on his new book, To Sanctify the World, uh, it prodded me into finally getting the book that I had been planning on reading for a couple of months. So I got it on my Kindle about a week ago, and I just got off a six-day trip, and George, I read the whole thing. Uh, cover to cover, it was a joy. So I just have two things I wanna share about George. Uh, when I was an assistant professor, excuse me, I was an associate professor at NC State, uh, I was in a Catholic men's group. Uh, and it was not a big group, it was 30 or 40 people. Uh, and we started a series of talks called Truth and Culture. And uh, one of my friends said, well, why don't we invite George Weigel? And I said, boy, that's a great idea. And they said, well, why don't you figure out how to invite him? And so I reached out to George and inviting, invited him, and he was kind enough to come down and, and do a lecture for us and uh, do Q&A, and that told me a lot about George, just his uh, kindness, his humanity, uh, his willingness to share his knowledge with anyone and everyone. Uh, and we really had a wonderful visit, George. That We remember that. In fact, I, I traded emails with someone today uh, about, about that time. The second thing I wanna share is I've, I've been a George Weigel fan for quite a while. I think I've read, I think I've read 11 or 12 of your books. So I noticed a couple over there that I don't have and I'm like, oh, I probably need to read those. When I read this book, I thought, this is really an outstanding book. I, I have read probably 10 or 12 books on Vatican II. I've read 
Ralph McInerney's book. I've read Walter O'Malley's book. I've read Aidan Nichols' book. I've read a bunch of books on Vatican II. This may be the best. So I'm, I'm very excited to be here. And George, I just want to, I want to thank you for, for joining us tonight. All right, great. Um, so just picking up on where the president left off, George, uh, he just mentioned that there are a bunch of books on the Second Vatican Council. Why another one? Well, let me uh, first of all thank you, Joe, for the invitation to be here. Thank Peter for that introduction. Joe, you said everyone knows what I do. I was under the impression that only my confessor knows everything that I do. <laughs> well, <laughs> he's leaking. He's leaking, right. Uh, well, very good. It's great to be here. I, as Joe uh, indicated, I've been uh, happy to be part of this uh, institute in, a, in an extended way ever since its beginning. I think it's a great, great initiative here uh, at the Catholic University of America, unlike that. Not, not to be confused with that small school in northwestern Indiana that uh, <laughs> Dr. Kilpatrick previously uh, inhabited. Uh, about two years ago, it occurred to me that we were approaching the 60th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council. And yet there was still this vast, confused and often confusing argument about exactly what was this all about? So I decided to try to answer that uh, question with a book that uh, is divided into three parts. Uh, first of all, why was the council necessary? Uh, secondly, what did the council actually teach? And third, what is the authoritative interpretation of this council? The first part I thought was important to explore uh, because, frankly, so many of our most vital and vibrant young Catholics today really know nothing about the modern history of the church. Uh, and if you don't know something about the modern history of the church, uh, you will not understand why John the Twenty-Third uh, found it necessary, thought it necessary, to summon the 21st Ecumenical Council in, in Catholic history. Uh, there is a great mythology uh, around, surrounding preconciliar Catholicism, uh, which holds that everything was just fine and dandy, so why did we have to have this big explosive mess uh, called the Second Vatican Council? Well. One of the people who thought that was absolutely not true, that things were not all fine and dandy, was a young Bavarian theologian, 31 years old at the time, named Joseph Ratzinger, who uh, wrote a very important article in 1958 that I cite in the book, saying the church is facing uh, a completely new situation in the Western world that was um, presaged or in a sense foretold by John Henry Newman in, uh, 18, uh, in the 18, uh, late 1870s. Uh, when Newman, giving a sermon at the dedication of a new English cemetery, a seminary, said, the church has never had experience before of a world simply irreligious. Church had 2,000 years of history of dealing with pagans, but pagan religiosity understood that we live within a larger, more comprehensive reality than we can perceive here and now. And however odd paganism's ways of, of dealing with that were, there was this sense of the transcendent. And what Newman saw coming in the Western world was a world without transcendence. That was the world described by Henri de Lubac, who would become one of the great fathers of, theological fathers of Vatican II in 1942, in his book, The Drama of Atheistic Humanism, when he described what a, what a world without any sense of transcendent reality would do. Uh, in the introduction to that book, Father de Lubac wrote, it is not true that men cannot organize the world without God. They can't. 
but without God, they can only organize it against each other. The world becomes a circular firing squad. And that, of course, is what happened in the first half of the 20th century. So Ratzinger, de Lubach, and many others understood this was a new situation. The old formulas of expressing Catholic faith were not going to be adequate to dealing with it. A raison small, a renewal of the church by a return to its biblical and patristic roots was necessary to find the conceptuality and the language that might crack through this uh, world without windows, doors, and skylights. And John the Twenty-Third understood that too. We can talk about him a little bit later, why he was uniquely positioned to perceive that. So that's the why of the council. Then I, I thought it important to, to offer readers a view of the 16 documents of Vatican II read in their proper order. These are not 16 equal things. Some animals are more <laughs> indeed more important than other animals, and some conciliar document, documents are indeed more important than others. So I read the rest of the council through the prism of its two dogmatic constitutions, De Verbum on divine revelation, Lumen Gentium on the church, which I believe answer the two, were attempts to answer the two great questions being posed by late modernity. What is the human person? And what is authentic human community? Then finally, the third part of the book takes up um, an idea that I think I first learned from someone who spent a lot of time in this neighborhood, Father, now Archbishop Augustine de Noia, who, who said to me years ago, what is really distinctive about Vatican II is that it, it was the council without keys. Every other council had given you the keys to its own authentic interpretation. Nicaea I has a creed. Chalcedon and Ephesus have dogmatic definitions. Other councils have condemnations or canons written into the legal system of the church. Trent did a lot of that and added a catechism. Vatican II did none of that. Okay? No creed, no definitions, no condemnations, no canons, no catechism. So therefore, how do you understand these 16 documents and their proper relationship and uh, as an organic whole? And my argument is that the pontificates of John Paul II and Benedict XVI, both of whom were influential figures at Vatican II, uh, especially Joseph Ratzinger. I came to the view in the course of this that Ratzinger really was one of the three most productive and influential theologians at the council, along with Yves Congar, uh, French Dominican, and Gerard Philippe, uh, a Belgian uh, professor at Louvain, who was in fact so influential that Congar, in his council diaries, jokes that Vatican II really should have been called Louvain I <laughs> because of the influence of this fellow. So I try to show how how JP2 and, and B16 uh, gave us the keys to interpret the council without keys, and how the catechism of the Catholic Church, a product of the Synod of 1985 called to look at the council after 20 years, is a kind of key chest to those keys that remains eminently uh, both true and useful today. So that, that's what I, why I thought this was necessary, and that's how I tried to address it. Great. Thank you. Let's go back um, to what you said more or less provoked it, was this sensibility that a lot of, I can't remember how you described this, but a lot of active young Catholics seem not to understand um, or, or have a sense of the history um, and how uh, fraught, perhaps, the moment was that provoked the council. Uh, if, let's say if we're trying to be sympathetic to that perspective, um, which often seems to sort of suggest that the council messed things up, right? That it wasn't, you know, there, that things weren't so fraught and it messed things up. But you concede that it didn't provide its own keys for interpretation um, and that those had to be sort of 
the keys had to be presented a little bit later on in the personages of uh, Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict. Uh, it, it's, what, what would you say as a response in terms of what constructively the council offers read in the light of those keys that can help address some of this vexed or fraught situation that it was responsive to? Um, first of all, let's, let's understand that every council has to be understood in its distinctive historical context. Um, the first Vatican Council, which was truly the first modern council, um, was responding to a very specific set of problems. Uh, rationalism and European thought, which seemed again to be pointing towards this world simply irreligious, and uh, the rise of forms of government that sought to make the church subordinate to the state. Okay, so there's a specific context there, and you really cannot understand Vatican I's teaching on the universal jurisdiction of the Pope or on the narrow definition of, of the infallibility of the Pope without understanding, without understanding that. So I thought it important to sketch what the first half of the 20th century looked like that provoked John the 23rd to, uh, to uh, uh, summon the council. Second point that I think is, is very important to understand. Let me, let me say that before I actually started work on the book, I wrote 50 professors, some of whom may even be in this room, um, seminary rectors, heads of religious institutes and novitiates saying, what don't... Now I'm hurt. I'm yeah. hurt <laughs> uh, what don't young people know and what do they need to know about, about the council? Uh, so the book very much reflects the answers I got to that. And one of the things that was clear that, that not only young people don't know, most people don't know, is that every council in the history of the church began, was preceded by controversy, was conducted in controversy, and was followed by controversy. This is why, thank God, there have only been 21 of these things in 2,000 years. They are... <laughs> inevitably takes about turbulent, to, yeah. and it takes about 100 years to sort it out. If everyone thinks that the that Tridentine Catholicism jumped into being in 1590, well, you know, I have a nice bridge in Brooklyn that I can sell you. I mean, that it took 100 years for that Tridentine um, conceptuality and ethos and way of being church to, to work its way into the... Um, fabric of, of Catholic life. To your question, uh, the council addressed the burning question of what is the human person by putting Christocentricity back at the heart of, of Catholicism. Tridentine Catholicism over the centuries had come to be a form of Catholicism that essentially proclaimed the church and its institutions, the societas perfecta, the perfect society, and you come to Christ through that. People like Ratzinger and de Lubach and others understood that was not going to work in a world become simply irreligious, a world skeptical of all forms of traditional authority, the encounter with Christ the Lord, a charismatic approach, to the proclamation of, of Christian truth had to take the place of that ecclesiocentricity. And what was the church going to say in this new Christocentric focus? Comes in, in, in paragraph 22 of Gaudium et Spes, the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. In Jesus Christ, we meet both the truth about God, but also the truth about us that the, the icon of a genuine humanism is Christ the Lord incarnate, crucified, and risen, because it's the risen Christ who reveals the ultimate destiny intended for all humanity from the beginning. We are more than congealed stardust, okay? There's a lot more going on here 
than random biochemical forces that happen to come together on this weird little planet um, to form us. There's, there's more going on here. And then the Council and the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church um, answered the question of authentic human community, which had bedeviled humanity since the uh, collapse of traditional communities through the Industrial Revolution, the uh, revolution of political life following the French Revolution, the cultural revolutions beginning in the 16th century, and the intellectual, religious, and so forth, all forms of traditional community had broken down. Uh, I, I read a piece recently quite fascinating about which somebody said that, you know, if, if a man had died in the English Midlands in the late 13th century and had come back at the end of, so he dies, let's say he dies in 1280, and he comes back in 1480 or 1500, he's going to feel right at home. Nothing had changed. The same families were there. They were all doing the same jobs. The same church was there. They were all going to the same church. The same rhythms of life were there. All of that went in the Western world uh, in the process we call modernization. So therefore, where do you find authentic co community? Well, the Nazis thought you could find it in a racial community. Marx thought you could find it in the community of the, of the proletariat. Uh, utilitarians said you could find it by the consumer society. N none of these worked very well, and some of them were absolutely lethal in the highest extreme. The, ch the council, picking up from St. Paul, that biblical root of the church, says if you want to know what authentic human community looks like, it looks like a communion of disciples in which there is neither Greek nor Jew, slave nor free, male nor female, because all are one in Christ Jesus. And if you understand that about the church, you ought to be able to build analogously out from that in, in the civil sphere. So those are two, those, and great. those things seem absolutely important to me today. Great, great. Um, so I, I didn't realize you were a, uh, conciliar originalist. Um, you spend some time you spend some time in the book um, talking a little bit about uh, Pope John the 23rd's intention for the council. Perhaps you should speak you know the audience a little bit about that and then of course just answer the question was the attention attained you know did it yeah. did it meet its end? <clears throat> uh, I, I am indeed a conciliar originalist in that I believe if you want to know what this was supposed to effect then there are four texts from John the 23rd, uh, including most importantly his opening address to the council on October 11th, 1962, that give you the clearest window into, into that intention and purpose. In a word, the purpose of the council was evangelization. John the 23rd, who had a very distinctive experience, unlike many of his papal predecessors of the previous several hundred years, knew that in contemporary culture, the cultural transmission of Catholicism was over. By the end of the 20th century, he understood no one in France, or certain parts of France at least, was going to be a Catholic because they were French from that certain part of France. Uh, it was true of Spain, that was true of Portugal, that was true of Bavaria, that was true everywhere. Therefore, the church had to rediscover its essence as an evangelical enterprise. The gospel had to be proposed, the gospel was not going to be transmitted by DNA, by, by ethnic inheritance. Um, Second, in order to do that, the church had to re-experience the dramatic effect of meeting the risen Lord and the Holy Spirit. And that's why John the 23rd often talked about his hope that uh, the Second Vatican Council would be a new Pentecostal experience. Not simply, not, not, not in the sense of a transient spiritual high, but in the sense of that profound um, experience of the 
fiery presence of God, which does what? It doesn't leave you to sit in the upper room and say, how nice, that was cool, can we do that again? You go out and you tell everybody else what you have seen and heard. Okay, so an evangelically oriented experience of Pentecost. Uh, so I think, uh, now, what, did that happen? Was that intention <clears throat> successfully fulfilled? I would argue that if you live it, look at the living parts of the world church today, they are those parts of the world church that have embraced the teaching of Vatican II as authoritatively um, uh, interpreted by John the, Paul II and Benedict XVI and are getting on with the business of evangelization. I think that's true all over the world church. And I think the dying parts of, of the world church um, uh, are those that um, continue to misinterpret the council as an invitation to reinvent Catholicism. We do not have the authority to reinvent Catholicism. This is Christ's church, it's not our church, and that's not what councils are for. Councils are not parliamentary assemblies or constitutional assemblies rewriting constitutions. They're attempts to clarify disputed points of Catholic self-understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, or um, they are efforts to develop the church's self-understanding, as Vatican II surely did, on, on several questions, including the nature of divine revelation, the nature of the church, uh, religious freedom, the church's relationship to living Judaism, ecumenism, and, and so forth. But uh, if you look around the world church today, where things are moribund or worse, it's where the reInvent Catholicism project, most prominently in Germany today, is going ahead full blast. Um, and the only reason this goes on in Germany is not because anybody's following it. Uh, I mean, ma mass atten Sunday mass attendance in most German cities is 2%. It's because of money, because the church is fabulously wealthy from the, the, the Kirchensteuer, the, the church tax, and therefore can, aff can afford this vast bureaucratic apparatus um, that drives these uh, processes of reinventing Catholicism forward, but with no discernible evangelical impact. All right, so you, you mentioned uh, the t two of the keys that you identify in the book, um, Pope John Paul II's uh, pontificate, Pope Benedict's. Uh, you also discussed a third one, if I remember right. Uh, you, you mentioned the catechism, uh, right? And I mean, I know from my own experience that the catechism has, has served as an instrument, in fact, for the evangelization of people. It's actually, you know, contributed to people's conversions and so on. Speak a little bit to um, the role the catechism itself has played in advancing the intention or, you know, trying to attain the attention of the council. Uh, the catechism of the Catholic Church uh, was the result of the extraordinary synod, the special synod of 1985, which John Paul II summoned to look at what had happened in the 20 years since Vatican II. Uh, five weeks in Rome, bishops from all over the world. Uh, one of the concrete, or specific, programmatic proposals that came out of that was that there should be a catechism a new catechism drawn up reflecting the theological uh, approach of Vatican II. As the Council of Trent had led to the Roman Catechism, uh, which was uh, heavily influenced, as you know, by St. Charles Borromeo. So this was all put in the hands of, of Cardinal Ratzinger, and uh, I think a brilliant job was done, which turned out to have an importance that I don't think was anticipated in 1985. It took, took about seven or eight years to do this and then get the translations done. So by the time this large explication of Catholic faith and life appears, we're on the edge of the turn of the millennium. 
And lo and behold, no other Christian communion after 2,000 years of history felt it either necessary or felt itself capable of giving a comprehensive account of what we believe, how we worship, what we think makes for righteous living, and, and how we think we grow in the life of faith through prayer. Nobody else did that at, at, at the turn into a third millennium of Christian history. So in addition to giving Catholics a reliable benchmark of Catholic faith and practice, the catechism turned out to be a, a kind of robust profession of faith at the end of, of the second millennium. Hey, we can still explain how all of this fits together, even in its most challenging bits and pieces. All right, uh, prospectively, I'm sort of like looking forward just a little bit. Uh, with the passing of Pope Benedict, uh, we have really no intellectual, living intellectual connection any longer to the Second Vatican Council. Um, how do you, th how do you, if you can guess, uh, like how do you think that's going to color the way the council is interpreted moving forward, if at all, um, not to have, you know, a, a Ratzinger, not to have, um, you know, you, one of your other keys, Pope John Paul II. And then the second sort of prospective piece of this, what aspects of this evangelical intentionality that you identified do you see in the pontificate of Pope Francis? Of Pope Francis? What is he bringing forward um, out of the Second Vatican Council? We, we really did mark the end of an era right. <clears throat> when, um, uh, when Pope Benedict's Requiem was celebrated in Rome. I think I, think I led off the, the uh, coverage of that on uh, MSNBC that day by saying exactly that. This is I'm saying farewell to a great man, important pope, but this is the end of an era. I mean, something is coming to an end here that was full of creativity, that was full of human gracefulness, um, and that is likely unrepeatable because of the unique yeah. historic circumstances out, out of which it grew. Um, I have a lot of friends now I've made over the last 10 years in the church in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, who are an enormous source of encouragement to me. Uh, the fantastic church, of, the growth of the church in sub-Saharan Africa is, is almost completely ignored throughout a lot of the world church. But it's, it's one of the most dynamic parts of Catholicism in the world today. It's producing tremendous leaders, as it, as it has in the past. Uh, men like Cardinal Francis Arinze, Cardinal Robert Sara, uh, others, um, there are more of them coming. Yeah. And they are all people of the Second Vatican Council, rightly understood. So I think they will be carrying this forward. And of course, they will read those documents in the proper order, but they'll also read them from their own distinctive perspective. These are new Christians. Uh, I mean, Cardinal Renze baptized his parents. You know, th that sort of thing didn't happen in the church for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, so they are going to bring a, a different optic to this. That may be true of parts of the church in Asia and the Pacific uh, as well. Uh, I thought Evangelii Gaudium, uh, Pope Francis's first apostolic letter, was a robust affirmation of Vatican II as a call mm -hmm. to the new evangelization. Um, I think where the Holy Father and I are stay positive, George disagreed, and we've discussed this personally. I'm, you know, this is part of my conversation with him. Is I am convinced that there is an iron law of Christianity and modernity according to which Christian communities that maintain 
a clear sense of their identity and boundaries can not merely survive but flourish, and Christian communities that can't tell you exactly what they believe and what puts you in and, and just as importantly what puts you out uh, wither and die. And he just simply doesn't accept that. So we have agreed to disagree on that. All right, I'll leave that an open question for people to follow up on. So like um, President Kilpatrick, I, I, I really found the book um, not merely good, but also in, in some places quite moving. And it sort of struck me that to some extent, the, the era that's ending is also your era. You know, there's, a, there's almost like a, per, there's almost like a, <laughs> there's almost a personal, I'm gonna, t I'm gonna attach this to something in a second. Um, there's, a, there's a personal quality. What, my obituary? <laughs> it, yeah. it's, that's, on, that's already on my computer, yes. Uh, <laughs> just had to put the date in. Um, the, uh, Card uh, the uh, Pope Benedict just passed, just within a week or so, um, Cardinal Pell passed. I know you were at, uh, I'm very close to Cardinal Pell. I know you were at Pope Benedict's funeral. Can you just speak a little bit to the loss to the church of not merely Pope Benedict, but of course also Cardinal Pell, and you know, just perhaps again tie that to um, where you might see us headed? <clears throat> uh, Cardinal Pell was uh, a friend of mine for 55 years. He came to my parish in Baltimore when I was 16 years old, and 1967 as a newly ordained young Australian priest on his way to doctoral studies in Oxford. Uh, we became friends that summer, remained friends for over a half a century, and, and worked very, very closely together over the last several decades. And uh, it was an honor for me to defend him uh, in his time of trial when uh, he really became a white martyr. I mean, he, he became someone who suffered greatly for uh, having stood up for the truth uh, in the church in Australia and in Australian society and paid a very heavy uh, price for that. Um, what the church lost uh, when, when Cardinal Pell died was precisely that kind of moral witness. I mean, he had become a unique figure in the church, and I was saying to, to you and, and President Kilpatrick before we began that uh, the Cardinal and I walked into St. Peter's together uh, to pay our respects to Pope Benedict when he was lying in state on that Tuesday morning. And I was, I, I mean, I'm used to watching the San Pietrini, the little people of the Basilica, the guards, the ushers. You know, they see eminent people all the time, and they don't pay a whole lot of attention to it. Um, th there, was a, there was a reverence that they were displaying to, to Cardinal Pell that was, it, you know, it was like John Fisher had gotten out of the Tower of London and was, uh, you know, in business in, uh, in the Britain of Henry VIII. Um, and nobody can replace that. Yeah. Nobody can replace that. But the example is there. And um, it is an example of radical fidelity. Uh, if you read uh, the Cardinal's prison diaries, uh, this was a man uh, very much centered on, on God and Christ. Um, and that allowed him not simply to survive as a man, but it allowed him to be a kind of evangelist in an orange prison jumpsuit in this crummy prison in Australia where those uh, awful people wouldn't let him say mass for 404 days. Um, so that example is there, and um, uh, I hope it will inspire people uh, uh, going forward. Fantastic. So we have microphones, um, and if you want to ask a question, uh, just raise your hands, and I'll acknowledge you, and the microphone will speedily be, be delivered to you. Uh, and uh, you can ask George anything. I, Father, do you, do you have a question for George? Okay. Um, thank you, John Henry. Th thanks very much. Um, the, last, uh, the very last publication of Cardinal Pell was about the Continental Document for the Synod. And in that publication of Cardinal Pell, he emphasized the role of the bishop. 
and Christus Dominus in Vatican II. It's one of the uh, one of the features of Vatican II that solidified really the Church's understanding of the role of the bishop and his authority coming directly from Jesus Christ. And Cardinal Pell uh, criticized this tendency recently, also in law. Um, although I don't think you mentioned specifically the the legal changes that affect also the. The, the status of the, the diocesan bishop that has recently occurred. Um, he commented more on how, in the document on the synod, the, the role of the bishop in, in voting and determining the, the content of the, 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 the consensus of, of the documents of the synod moving forward. I just um, wondered if you could comment on to what extent that this is an important feature of Vatican II that, or, or is, is this something that perhaps moving forward can be, um, I mean, it looks like a, a kind of increase of central centralization in the Vatican, while at the same time looking, according to synodality, as something that is somehow uh, potentially uh, more governance being determined by consent of the people, or, yeah. so which is certainly not, which is what, what exactly what Cardinal Pell was criticizing. What, what should we expect looking forward? And those who want to promote the, the key uh, for reading um, the council, what, what should we, how, how should we understand the, the role of the, or, the, the ordinary the local bishop? Uh, thanks, Father Gall. Uh, uh, as you hinted, one of the great achievements of the Second Vatican Council was to rebalance the ecclesiology of, of the church and specifically of holy orders. Vatican I had given us a pretty thick understanding of the papacy, but then Vatican I was ended unexpectedly by the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War and was suspended and never reconvened. And the next thing on the agenda was going to be to talk about the bishops and their relationship to this, uh, to the papacy. So that didn't happen for almost 100 years. And there was an imbalance in the church's self-understanding to the point where you know, bishop, local bishops came to be understood as kind of branch managers of Catholicism, Inc. And the orders came from the CEO in Rome, namely the Pope, and all the, the local branch manager was to do was to follow the orders and implement the decision. Well, that's not a very biblical or patristic understanding of the episcopate. So the Second Vatican Council developed that thick theology of the episcopate, which had not been developed by Vatican I. Uh, by the way, it's in, one of the interesting little factoids in all of this is that one of the first things John Twenty Third had to do was declare Vatican I over, which he did by saying this is going to be called the Second Ecumenical Council of the Vatican. This is not going to be Vatican I reconvened after 90-some years. And in that thicker theology of the Episcopate, it is understood that Episcopal ordination conducted in communion with the Bishop of Rome confers the authority to teach, govern, and sanctify. Now, you can only exercise that authority to govern in communion with the Bishop of Rome but you don't get it from him. You get it from the Sacrament of Holy Orders. Uh, there are very real questions about whether the new curial document, Predicate Evangelium, does not contradict that in, in many respects. Um, and this is going to have to be sorted out in the, in the next pontificate. Um, as for the discussion group model of Catholicism, I think it was six weeks before Cardinal Pell's piece, which he and I had actually discussed in early December, uh, came out in The Spectator right after his death. I wrote a piece saying that the Continental Synod, Continental Stage of the Synod working document reduced the bishops to note takers and secretaries who, you know, who would send little you know, book reports into, into GHQ in Rome, where again, a group of people would decide what all of this meant. This is not the theology of the Episcopate of Vatican II. And the same thing is going on in Germany. Uh, so there's a real problem here. And the notion that these 
synodal processes, at least as they have been lived so far, are expressions of the Second Vatican Council, I think are hard to square with the theology of the Episcopate of Vatican II. Very good. Other questions? <coughs> Peter, do you have a question? Uh, I do. But I, I saw someone else's hand. Up. I'll, I'll get to him in a second, yep. <clears throat> so, George, first of all, uh, thanks for joining us again tonight. Um, I made some notes here. Uh, when, you, when you mentioned that in a word, uh, the, you know, Pope John's intention was all about evangelization. Right. So, so my, I guess my question is, and I also made a note when you said, the most living part of the church right now, or the most maybe one of the most vibrant parts of the church, is the church in sub-Saharan Africa. I recall a mass I, I went to um, with an African priest in an American parish, where the priest was very charismatic and sang to the congregation a love song uh, during his homily that went on for several minutes. And, uh, you know, candidly, I, I was very moved by that. I was very touched by that. So my question is, uh, have we properly realized the full meaning of sacrosanctum concilium in enlivening the liturgy so that it is truly evangelizing? Now, I know that the liturgy can be very evangelizing just through its reverence. And, and that's important, and we don't want to lose that. But are there other dimensions of the liturgy that, that need to be informed by the, the true intention of Vatican II? The liturgy wars have been going on for so long, and I think most many of us are so tired of them that it's, it's hard to... Um, try to have a fresh thought in all of that. I had the distinct impression that what Pope Benedict XVI had intended to do with the, uh, with Samorum Pontificum, namely have the more uh, ready availability of the older form of the Mass uh, act as a kind of re-sacralizing agent if you will, or uh, example, on, on the celebration of the Novus Ordo. Uh, and I think that was happening. Uh, it was happening for that reason. It was happening because a younger generation of priests had been formed in a different uh, liturgical sensibility. And I thought things were moving in the right direction. So I have, I'm not saying anything I haven't said in print. I think Traditionis Custodes was a serious mistake and I hope it will be reversed by the next pontificate. Uh, I say that as a Novus Ordo man, um, but I, I do not uh, understand, and I think it's very difficult to, to demonstrate any positive effect out of this attempt to deny uh, people a form of worship that they find grace-filled and enriching, and in fact, mission empowering. Because if, if you look at some of the parishes where this was a, you know, a more uh, uh, common form of the celebration of the Eucharist. These are evangelical parishes. They're, they're going out and, and bringing people in. Um, one of the things that has gotten lost in what we call the liturgy wars is a sense of what the liturgical movement, beginning in the late 19th century, actually late 18th century, throughout the 19th century and then into the first half of the 20th century was about. It was certainly about restoring a sense of sacred dignity to the celebration of the sacred liturgy, so we're going to get rid of operatic screaming and yelling and all of this sort of stuff. And then Pius X did a lot of that. Um, there was the great question of the restoration of the Easter Vigil, which Pius XII took care of. But all of this was in aid of two other aims, equipping the people of the church for mission and reforming society. There was a close, close linkage, never closer than at St. John's in Collegeville, Minnesota, between the liturgical movement 
and, and mid 20th century Catholic social doctrine. Because it was understood these two things go together. That a renewed liturgy would equip uh, Catholics not simply for evangelization in the specific sense of the term, but for their civic and public roles as, as uh, salt and light in, in civic life. And we need to recapture that. Excellent. Josh, you had your hand up, right? Um, so the microphone that way. <clears throat> Are there other hands? Okay, very good. Josh. Well, Mr. Weigel, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, you're, if I might thank you personally, uh, your writing has had a great impact uh, on my own spiritual journey. Uh, you disabused me of the notion that uh, the ersatz traditionalism of which I've been a part was actually Catholic orthodoxy. So thank you very much for that. Uh, my question is not uh, especially theological in nature, although it is in a more removed sense. But I know that in a great deal of your writing, you have written on matters of foreign policy, and in even Vatican foreign policy with your uh, works on Ostpolitik. Uh, now, in March of last year, you uh, recommended a particular text, The Catholic Tradition and of the Law of Nations, or something like that. I got the book out of the library. Uh, thanks to my clumsiness, I partially destroyed it, uh, but uh, that's, that's something else. It's still readable. I, I wasn't charged for it. Uh, but the point of your particular column was Catholics used to have a serious uh, intellectual tradition grappling with questions of practical you know, foreign politics. Yeah. And the Second Vatican Council, of course, took place in, during a different uh, social uh, circumstance. But more lately, we have seen the church move in a very... And I want to speak guardedly here so that you know, people don't read into my words, but in a very anti-war direction. Of course, the church opposes war. It's, it's bad in, in itself. But there's been a turn against the just war tradition uh, as, as a tradition. I believe there was something in Fratelli Tutti about that. Uh, so as the church now moves into a different era in the 21st century, where do you see the recovery of a genuine Catholic uh, theology of, for, of foreign policy. Uh, where do you see that in the church and in the lay life? Thank you. Um, thank you for your <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you for your kind words. Um, um, curiously enough, <clears throat> this may come out of Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> even the most dialogue-oriented. Uh, personalities in the Vatican have been forced to say that Ukraine has a has a right of self-defense and that this should be conducted according to the tenets of the just war tradition uh, so in fact the just war tradition is alive if not as intellectually robust as it, it was in, in the past but it may well be that um, this wholly unexpected experience, I mean, nobody expected on f January 30th, 2022, that a land war of this magnitude, with this level of destruction, this level of viciousness, this uh, number of casualty figures, was gonna break out in Europe. This was just not, that was all, in the past. Well, it's manifestly not. Um, and I think the way the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church has conducted itself during this uh, has been magnificent um, and uh, may lead to a, a real renaissance of, of uh, thinking about the justified use of proportionate and discriminate armed force as a means of building the peace of, of freedom, order, and, and justice. Um, these things are not well understood, I'm afraid, in the bureaucracy of the Holy See at the moment. Um, in the school where the Vatican's diplomats are trained, they are still teaching the Ostpolitik of Cardinal Casseroli as the ne plus ultra of Vatican diplomatic success. That is a complete 
falsehood. The Ostpolitik barely kept the church alive in a few places, but was a comprehensive disaster, as I think I have demonstrated from primary source materials and at least three books right now. Um, so there really does have to be some rethinking about, about all of this. And that, that's going to include stretching the just war tradition, you know, which I've been arguing for for years. I mean, going back to the book I was stupid enough to call Tranquillitas Ordinus, um, never give a book these days a Latin title. Uh, it's very bad on talk radio. Um, uh, the butchery is really quite disturbing. But I, <coughs> I, you know, I talked about, okay, there's a jus ad bellum, you know, what, what are the conditions that lead to a justified use of armed force? There is a jus in bello, how do you do that in a proportion discriminate way? But I coined the phrase jus ad patria. There, there, there has to be some body of thought about how do you build peace out of this because on this point, Clausewitz was right. If war is not the continuation of politics by other means, then it's simply barbarism. And the politics has to lead to the ends of politics, to freedom, justice, order, security, etc. So there has to be this third leg on the stool, if you will, the just war tradition. And um, you know, I, I'm not gonna be around long enough to do that, but Joe can note that in the obituary that somebody else is going to have to have to take that up. I've taken that up, as you may know, George. <laughs> right? Um, in some of my own work, um, uh, I know. I, I know. I have a question over here, Michael. Thank you. Um, Cardinal Newman came up earlier, and I want to go back. Um, I don't know. It must have been he himself who said the thing that I'm thinking of like in the eight, late 1830s, let's say, or whatever, they were worried that a lot of young people were not going deeper into the Anglican tradition as they were trying to bring about, but instead they were leaving, and they were going to Rome. And I think it was Newman himself who said that we've created expectations that we can't fulfill. Now, I'm actually worried that there's a lot of young Catholics, by young, I guess I mean 15, 20, 25, 30, who grew up in the sort of JP2, B16 Catholicism, and they want the real thing. And they go down to their local random church and they don't see it. Some of them get lucky and find one. Some of them go a little farther afield and find something more traditionalist. Sometimes it's healthy, but it's not always healthy. Some of it's kind of wacky. Some of them go schismatic. Some of them go, in a sense, farther and become orthodox. What do we, what's, what's the problem? Why can't centrist, everyday Catholicism meet the yearnings of these people? And what do we have to do to make it magnetic and not just something that people drift away from because they're drawn to something? Yeah. Um, one one uh, thing that I, I intended to say a while ago, uh, I'll say now as, as just of a prelude to trying to answer your question. Um, particularly among vital young people, I mean, people who are serious about being intentional Catholics, uh, there can be a, a, a kind of an elementary logical error here, which I call in the book post-concilium ergo propter concilium, which is a variant on, obviously, post hoc ergo propter hoc. It is not the case that everything that happened since the council happened because of the council. Uh, one of the many curiosities that I intend to take up with higher authority uh, <laughs> at the appropriate moment after Joe's obituary appears is why did you arrange things that wonderful texts like De Verbum, Lumen Gentium, et cetera, landed just when the cultural tsunami of the 60s was, you know, roaring through the Western world. Um, and those cultural headwinds remain very strong. Um, I think in terms of parish life, 
we're in a, <laughs> it's the old joke about Adam and Eve, you know, we live, my dear, in an age of transition as they go out of the garden. Um, all moments are transitional moments. This is a particular one uh, where um, parish as institution to be maintained is necessarily giving way to parish as platform for evangelization. Some places have caught on to that more than others. Some have come to understand that the quality of liturgy and specifically the quality of preaching to which we continue to give insufficient attention in seminaries um, is essential to that, to growing the parish. And this is gonna be the case for the foreseeable future. Um, uh, we have this wonderful college seminary here around the corner. I think some of its people are here tonight. Some of them may remember that I gave a talk by Zoom a while ago and my friend Father Griffin, the rector, invited me to do. And you may remember that in, in answer to a question, I said from the safety of my study in North Bethesda, Maryland, over the Zoom meeting, if you guys don't understand that you are entering a missionary vocation, leave now. You'll save yourself and everybody else a lot of trouble. The parish as sacramental service station that, that kind of just keeps clicking over by force of habit is done. I mean, if it's not done now, it'll be done in 20 years. So uh, we're going to have to grow our parishes. We're going to have to grow our congregations. Um, and that will be done in many, many ways. But one of them within the ambit of the church being Eucharistically centered because the Eucharist is Christ and the church is Christ-centered, is lifting up the quality of preaching, uh, breaking open the Word of God so that in the face of these cultural headwinds, people learn to see the world through a biblical lens. You don't see the world through the lens of the New York Times editorial board or you know, Eugene Robinson's latest column in the Washington Post or, you know, whatever was on uh, CNN that night. You see the world through a biblical lens and you start to perceive the dynamics of this moment in, in, in a biblical way. So, um, uh, we are going to be in a, t in a time of transition. But I still think, I mean, when I'm in Europe and people ask me, you know, what's good in the church in the United States, you know, I talk about reform seminaries, I talk about focus, I talk about growing religious orders of uh, women, uh, I talk about fantastic campus ministry, I think we're in a kind of golden age of campus ministry around the country. Uh, I talk about the way the theology of the body has redone marriage preparation and, and so forth. But I also talk about parishes. I mean, parishes still are the backbone, the skeleton of the church in the United States, and therefore we've got to figure out how to grow them. Fantastic, I think that's a great place for us to end, okay? Um, and again, I'm deeply grateful to George. I did not intend to sort of announce the end of George's time with us. Um, <laughs> You know, should George is era, should his era extend further? We'd love to have you back anytime, George. You're also welcome to come over to my parish, Our Lady of Lords, not in North Bethesda, but in Bethesda. It's fantastic. It's really, it's really thriving. Um, again, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you uh, for joining us online. Uh, this I think was an excellent conversation. Like I said, we have stuff um, to help refresh you, and also George is willing to stay and sign uh, his books for you. So again, let's give George a round of applause.